My name is Jonathan Lebecki. Uh, as of this morning, actually, I am a lifetime DAV member, um, but I've known Matt wherever he went off to uh, for quite a few years now. I served four years in the Marine Corps, eight years in the Army, medically retired from the Army in 2009, 100% permanent and total for PTSD, TBI, and a nice fun mix of physical injuries, as a lot of us have. Uh, Sitting to my right is Ben Everett, Senior Director of Medical uh, Science and Health Outcomes for uh, MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. And he'll be getting up after I, I talk for a few minutes. Part of the reason that I'm up here, hey, how do I, what do I do, hit enter? Yeah, just push the air up. There we go. <laughs> so I deployed to Iraq in uh, October 2005, returned October 2006. And within 60 days of returning home, I put a loaded nine millimeter to my temple and I pulled the trigger. After going to a church, after going to Womack Army Medical Center and begging for help. When I went to Womack, it was, it was rather funny. They uh, asked me if I had guns at home. I said, yes. They said, well, we're gonna give you six Xanax. Don't take it all at the same time because it'll kill you. When you get home on Christmas morning, and this was Christmas morning, they wanted me to wake my neighbors and give all my guns to them instead of, and then come back after the holiday. So I went home, and I drank a bottle of vodka, and I pulled out my gun. That was the first of five attempts to take my life over an eight year period. And for eight years, I lived in fear. I lived in my trauma. I had nightmares every night. I couldn't sleep. And, and I think one of the best illustrations of how bad my PTSD, above and beyond, when I lost hope and wanted to end my life, was actually the 4th of July before I went through MDMA-assisted therapy. I was in South Carolina, and anybody here from South Carolina? All right, you guys all know how much they love fireworks down in South Carolina. And so my neighborhood lit up literally like the 4th of July, just like Baghdad, just like Balad. And so I started having flashbacks. Um, and I was in my closet, in my body armor, with my service dog, and I thought I was in Iraq. Fortunately, at the, uh, my wife at the time actually took me to a VFW post um, to sit with other veterans. And this is where Organizations and VSOs like DAV are critical in, in helping keep our fellow veterans alive because I know personally if any veteran is in distress and just needs to talk, I will sit and I will talk with them for hours. It's also why I train my service dog over here to be a therapy dog. And she actually does more therapy for people uh, than she helps me. And so I realized every day that I needed help and help didn't exist, or at least I thought it didn't exist. And after my fifth and final suicide attempt, after I got out of the hospital, I, had, I, I finally got the VA to give me weekly therapy. And my, my, I'll, I'll give credit to my psychiatrist, she was great, and, and she upheld her promise. One day, she came down and she's like, hey, I got a situation with another veteran on the inpatient floor that I need to take care of, it's a critical situation. If you need medication, you know, I can, you can sit with my intern and you can pick it up at the pharmacy, but can we just meet next week? I'm like, you know, go take care of the other veteran. And I sat with the intern and that's what changed my life because the intern was an intern at the Medical University of South Carolina. And being an intern is probably the first one who had read my, my medical file, which is about this tall now. And she slid this piece of paper across the desk and it said, Google, Google PTSD MDMA. And I did. And I found out that MAPS Public Benefit Corporation was doing clinical trials on an innovative therapy in Charleston, um, MDMA assisted therapy. And frankly, I was like, had a lot of friends who used that substance. And I'm like, this is legal. This is a safe environment. Might as well try this before I die. And I went in, and then I went through three th sessions, eight hours each, under the influence of MDMA. And it starts off pretty simple. 
they ask kindergarten questions. I, I, I'm going to guess a lot of us have gone and spoke at schools and, and, and other places. And, you know, I, I love talking to little kids about the military and, and stuff like that. And one of the things I do is talk about how important math is that, you know, every military member needs to know math. Why? Because we've got to read maps and figure out how to get it from point A to point B. And they always ask the same kind of question. What was the food like? What was the weather like? Things like that. And that's the kind of questions they asked. And for the first time, I opened up. For the first time in eight years, I could open up with two specially trained therapists and work through it. And how it would work, I'd talk for a bit, put on eye shades, and then think for a bit. Then I'd talk for a bit, think for a bit. I can't tell you how long I talked for, and I can't tell you how long I thought for, because when you're under the influence of the medication, time becomes a weird thing. But it's the best therapy I've ever done in my entire life. I went in thinking I was going to talk about Iraq. I went in thinking I was going to talk about getting blown up. And I talked about everything in my life, from coming home and having my, my now ex-wife uh, moving in with another person, my abuse at the hands of my mother as a child, literally every traumatic event in my life I talked about. And then I went and I lived my life on my terms. That was eight and a half years ago. I'm one of the fortunate people on this planet who can say that I've been healed of PTSD longer than I actually had it. And I don't go sit in an office every day. One of my jobs is to go up on Capitol Hill and share my story that I'm sharing with you. But in my downtime, as you can see here, I go to Ukraine and I provide humanitarian aid. I've been shot at by Russians. I've been under artillery fire. I've sat in Kyiv, woken up from the air raid sirens that are, believe it or not, the same all over the world. <laughs> Wait for the bangs to go off, roll over, go back to sleep, not a single nightmare. This, th this therapy, this treatment, which is not just here, take a pill. It, it, it's medication in conjunction with extensive therapy to get at the root causes. The drug doesn't fix you. To be honest, you fix you. What MDMA does is it, it, it opens your mind, body, and spirit to the place it needs to be so that the therapy can work, so you can actually talk about it and, and not have your brain betray you with a panic attack or, or shutting down emotionally or becoming too emotional. It keeps you in this middle ground, which Ben's going to talk about here in a second. But I, I do ask everyone in this room to pay close attention to the science because I'm just a guy standing up here. I know in my heart and in my mind how effective this is and how much this will help every veteran with PTSD as well as every civilian. Because while we all argue over is it 22, is it 17, is it 44, those are numbers. Another number is 130. Regardless of veteran or not, 130 Americans take their life each and every day in America. And each one of those numbers has a name. And some of those names like Dusty Repass, a friend of mine that I served with, he took his life about a year ago. We were too late for them. It's time to stop being too late. And it's time to demand from the US government that they allow these treatments. And now I'll hand this over to Ben. Yeah, John, thanks so much for sharing your story, John. All right. Um, so my talk this morning is really going to fall into really kind of two to three phases. We're going to spend some time talking about PTSD. I understand everybody in this room is very familiar with PTSD, but I do want to spend just a couple of minutes going over through uh, some of the numbers, especially as they relate to, to military personnel and veterans. As John just uh, alluded to, we understand that suicide uh, risk and, and rate remains entirely too high among veterans. Um, the number has come down a little bit to about 17 veterans a day in 2020 taking their own life, but it's still way too many. And we know that PTSD is one of the highest drivers of suicidality in veterans. Um, so we have a long way to go to bring this number down further. Um, I'm sorry. I was on the wrong slide. There you go. There's the, 
<laughs> There's the, 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 the graph I was talking to just a second ago. Uh, and this is 57 percent high, higher among veterans uh, than the civilian population. So again, just entirely too high a burden that we're placing on our servicemen and women. Um, uh, with regard to suicidality. So we understand there's a number of different things that can predispose or, or lead to PTSD, including uh, being younger, uh, being female, um, being non-white, lower education status, and having a parent that had some kind of psychological issue as well. Um, we understand that rates of PTSD are much higher in military personnel than they are in the civilian personnel. So if you look at the left here, uh, the blue bar is women and the red, or excuse me, the orange is men. Um, and, and on the far left, we're looking at, at military and veterans. On the right, we're looking at civilians. And so women do tend to have higher rates of PTSD than men, um, but we can see among veterans the rate in men, male veterans, is just as high as civilian women. And again, military women, the rate is about twice that of military men. So really entirely, I don't want to say too high, but you know, the data are what the data are. Just PTSD remains a very large problem among service personnel and veterans. Um, and we understand that this has increased in the past two decades, largely because of the most recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2002, uh, the rate of PTSD was 1.24 for every 1,000 veterans. Uh, now that's 12, essentially 13 for every 1,000 veterans. We understand that combat exposure and combat trauma are among the leading causes of PTSD in the military, but that's not the only cause. Um, but about one and a half to three and a half times higher compared to non-deployed or non-combat exposed veterans. Um, fully 37 percent, so over a third of veterans that, retire, that returned from tours in Iraq and Af or Afghanistan uh, qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. And this isn't just these most recent wars. We understand that this has been a problem for as long as we've kept data on this, going back to World War II, Korea, Vietnam. So this last step here says that the prevalence of PTSD among veterans 40 years post-Vietnam was still 12.2 percent. And I understand from talking to psychiatrists at the VA that the highest uh, rate of new diagnosis of PTSD right now is actually Vietnam veterans. It's not veterans uh, returning from Iraq or Afghanistan. So let's dive into this a little bit more detail. So now we're going to look at two different things. On the left, we're just looking at what types of trauma can lead to PTSD specifically in veterans. All right, as I just alluded to, combat trauma is, is the largest single driver of PTSD. Uh, there's also being in a transportation accident that can include an IED attack or some type of assault with a weapon. What's not captured here, just because we have the three highest, is sexual trauma. 6.2% of, of individuals report sexual trauma as being the single driver or the largest driver of their uh, of trauma that led to their PTSD diagnosis. Now, you might look at this and say, well, Ben, these numbers add up to way more than 100%, and that's because for most patients with PTSD, it's not a single trauma. It's multiple traumas. Like John shared, a lot of times this starts in childhood. It can, intend, it can continue into your adult life, and it might not necessarily be just related to, to combat trauma. It can be what happened at home as well. So if we transition to the right, again, still just looking at these veterans, we're going to get PTSD severity. This is PTSD to, uh, severity as rated by the CAPS score. So CAPS is the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale. It's a tool that was developed by the VA for veterans. It has such a good track record of diagnosing and managing PTSD. It's now the gold standard for all clinical research with PTSD, but it's not really used clinically that much because it's an invasive, uh, it, it takes time, it takes about an hour to do this test. But just to give you an idea, this isn't a percent, this is actually the score you get on this test. So if you have a score of 28 to 34, that would mean you have moderate PTSD. If you have a score anywhere higher than 35, that means you have severe PTSD. So the three bars here are combat trauma, sexual trauma, and other trauma. Combat trauma, these patients have a score of about 69. So remember, 35 is severe PTSD. So this is almost twice the level that qualifies you for severe PTSD. So we would say these patients have actually extreme PTSD, the highest level of PTSD. The largest uh, 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 PTSD symptom severity is sexual trauma. So even though that's only 6.2% 
report that that's the largest driver of their PTSD, it's the highest amount of symptom burden. And then other trauma is really just a catch-all of, you know, it could be multiple different things rolled in together. So again, this just underscores that not only do veterans have higher rates of PTSD, they tend to have much higher severity of PTSD once diagnosed. We understand that military sexual trauma is a problem. Um, I think the VA is doing a better job now of identifying MST, reporting MST. MST does tend to be um, more in, in uh, female soldiers than male soldiers. One in three women that served reported MST. One in 50 men reported MST. What's interesting, though, is when we talk about who reports MST, a third of people who report MST are men. So it might not be that they had the trauma themselves, they might have witnessed it, but because of chain of command didn't report it. Um, something that made them feel uncomfortable that they witnessed. Um, so anyway, one third of men reporting MST. And getting back to suicidal ideation, again, just looking at veterans, we understand that PTSD, while PTSD in and of itself does increase rates of suicidality, there are a lot of comorbidities that come with PTSD, especially in combat exposed veterans like John have TBI, multiple other injuries that they're dealing with. Chronic pain is a really big problem, as is disordered sleep. So veterans with PTSD have about a 50% higher rate of suicidality than civilians. We looked at that earlier. If you have sleep disturbance or chronic pain, you're actually six times higher than veterans that just have PTSD to have suicidality. Um, and we understand that, again, these are very common comorbidities. So in terms of looking at some other comorbidities that veterans have with PTSD that might increase risk for suicidal ideation, we understand depression, generalized anxiety, uh, alcohol use disorder, uh, substance use disorders. Essentially, a lot of times patients end up managing their symptoms with alcohol or other substances uh, instead of actually getting you know, treatment that might actually prevent um, those types of things. And then lastly, to kind of tr close out this section, we understand that stigma is a really big problem um, for all mental health di uh, disorders. So I'm going to have some civilian data here and some military data here. But essentially, it is the strongest predictor, stigma is the strongest predictor of help-seeking behavior. The more stigma you have, the less likely you are to actually seek help. All right, an estimated 52 to 74 percent of individuals, this is civilians, with a mental disorder do not seek help. We understand that this is even higher in the military. 40, 40 to 6% of military personnel who could benefit from professional treatment do not seek help. Common concerns reported are my unit leadership might treat me differently, I would be seen as weak, or being discredited or devalued by their peers. All right. We also know that military personnel report higher symptom burden and higher levels of stigma, which again potentially delays diagnosis and potential treatment. And these are all compounded by perceptions that PTSD has a high economic burden, which we'll see in a second is true, uh, negatively impacts military duty performance, combat effectiveness, combat readiness. So in terms of the economic uh, um, impact that PTSD has to society, and this is looking uh, both at military veterans as well as uh, general civilians. This is a brand new paper, which was just published um, out of the Tuscaloosa and Birmingham Veterans Affairs Administration late last year. We understand that PTSD is a huge burden to the individuals that have PTSD, as well as their friends, families, and caregivers, but underneath that is a burden to society. Direct health care costs come in at $76 billion a year. Indirect health care cost at $36 billion per year. Loss of productivity at about $35 billion per year. So in the civilian population, we're spending about $20,000 per patient per year to treat PTSD. And frankly, we're not having very good outcomes. In the military, we're spending $26,000 per veteran per year to treat PTSD. And again, no innovation in this field. We're using the same things that we've been using for quite some time. And frankly, they're just not that effective, as shown by the graph here. So the VA recommends, as does the American Psychological uh, Association, first-line treatment for PTSD should be psychotherapy, therapy, counseling, right? Only a third of patients actually receive that, right? Less than a quarter receive some type of prescription therapy, usually an SSRI like Paxil or Zoloft uh, that go along with that. 44% of veterans 
patients get a combination of these two treatments. But when we look at these drugs, there's only two drugs that actually have an indication to treat PTSD, Zoloft and Paxil were uh, approved in the mid-2000s, and frankly, they're just not very effective. They have a lot of unwanted side effects associated with them. All these other drugs that are used to treat PTSD are used off-label. Another core issue here is all of these drugs, they just treat symptoms. They do not allow the patient that has PTSD to understand and try and reconcile or resolve the underlying trauma uh, that led to and continues to, to, to be a problem for their PTSD. So when we look at the right, we can see that even if you get combination therapy, the best, you know, what we consider now gold standard therapy for, for PTSD, less than half of patients actually remit from their PTSD. 56% of patients remain unrecovered. All right, this is for a number of reasons. Psychotherapy can be difficult to access. You're supposed to get eight sessions. It can be very difficult to get eight sessions. It can be difficult to get eight sessions with the same therapist. We understand that there's a lot of burnout, a lot of turnover in these things. Um, high dropout rates. Essentially, for this type of therapy to work, you have to relive the trauma over and over again until it's not a stigma to you anymore. A lot of people simply cannot do that. And as I indicated with the drugs, a lot of the drugs have unwanted side effects. Um, they just don't work that well. Uh, the effect sizes, we call the effect size, how uh, a measure of, of how well the treatment works are really pretty low, um, require chronic daily use. Um, and essentially just treating symptoms. So it's just take this pill for the rest of your life and hopefully you'll feel a little bit better. All right, so changing gears and trying to set up, you know, why we wanted to study MDMA to treat PTSD. Well, we understand there's a number of changes uh, in, the, in the mind when a patient has PTSD. Um, so the amygdala, I call that our lizard brain, so it's a very ancient part of the brain at the core of the brain. That's where we have our fight or flight um, 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 uh, system, and that's where we house uh, fear. And in patients with PTSD, their amygdala is, is overactive, so they have enhanced fear learning. Um, it, it can be very problematic. In the hippocampus, that's where our memories are supposed to be stored um, for appropriate uh, storage and, and access later on. And the prefrontal cortex, that's the front of our brain, that's where we kind of reconcile all this. We have a lot of emotion, uh, the way that we um, just deal with everyday life. So all of these things are disordered in patients with PTSD. And one of the things that's unique about MDMA and why we feel like this treatment modality is especially effective for patients with trauma is that it actually treats all three of these areas. It imparts um, changes in the brain to where it shuts down blood flow or it reduces blood flow to the amygdala so that you don't have this heightened fear uh, response so that you're actually able to access the memories in your hippocampus. And as John mentioned, a lot of times veterans um, going through this will you know, not just talk about their combat related um, uh, issues, but will remember things that happened in childhood um, that you know, maybe they didn't even realize that they had experienced these feelings will come up. And appropriately, we also have an increase, uh, increase in blood flow to the prefrontal cortex so that now patients are able to reconcile appropriately, um, get these memories where they're supposed to be and, and be at peace with those memories. All right, so uh, transition now to talk about MDMA-assisted therapy in individuals with PTSD. So to date, we've completed two phase three trials. Um, so that's what's required by the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA to seek a new drug uh, approval. And we'll go through that in a little bit later. I'm gonna, only gonna cover, uh, um, well, I'm gonna give you a little timeline that gives you an idea of how much research we've done, and then I'll talk about our first phase three trial uh, to date. So you can see here we've done a number of phase one, that's kind of the first time you study uh, an agent in people. We did six phase two studies that resulted in, in MDMA assisted therapy being labeled as a breakthrough therapy designation by FDA. It's very unusual to get breakthrough therapy designation. Less than 5% of new therapies actually get this uh, rating from the FDA. You have to apply for it. It's very unusual, so we're very proud of that and I think it just shows how promising this potential therapy is. We've completed both of our phase three studies. Um, the first phase three study was started in 2018, uh, closed down in 2020, was published late last year, and then our second phase three study uh, finished late last year. We had top line results uh, presented at a major psychological conference earlier this year, and we're expecting that paper to be published uh, in the next four to six weeks, hopefully. All right, so we use the exact same protocol in both of our phase three clinical registry studies with the FDA. Um, so 
you'll bear with me, there's a lot going on on this slide, so I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes kind of be, uh, orienting everybody to exactly what the, what the treatment might look like. All right, so um, essentially if a patient is deemed eligible to go in, they have to have a diagnosis for PTSD, they can't have known cardiovascular disease, a number of things, then they're randomized one-to-one -one in a double-blind manner, so the patient doesn't know what they're getting, the prescribing psychiatrist doesn't know what they're getting, and the therapist don't know what treatment they're getting. Every patient get the exact same level and amount of therapy. The only thing that changes is are they getting active MDMA or placebo. So the patient meets with a, a therapy team, so two different therapists. These are highly trained therapists, trauma-focused therapists. They meet with these people for three times to understand what's the nature of your trauma, get to know each other, to develop some kind of therapeutic alliance. And then also a lot of informed consent. Hey, if you get the MDMA, this is what the experience might feel like. This is what we hope to accomplish through this process. After those three sessions, the patients start three separate, essentially one month treatment cycles. So you can see the dark blue circle indicate, or excuse me, the dark blue triangle indicates the, the days that the patient actually takes the MDMA. So the patient takes MDMA, these sessions last about six to eight hours, as John said, and you're in a room with two therapists the entire time. So it's not like, hey, go take some MDMA and sit in a room by yourself. You are in a room with therapists to help you um, manage the experience, talk, and, and understand what you're going through. Following that, the patients then meet with the same therapy team three separate times for these integration sessions. Now these sessions only last 90 minutes, but essentially you talk through, not under the influence of MDMA, you know, what your memories were what you went through, what you experienced. And as you get to the last one, you wanna start setting up, all right, this is what we want to accomplish in our next session, okay? Um, primary endpoint for our study was looking at that CAPS, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale. Um, essentially, what their treatment burden was, what their, what their severity of their, their PTSD was as this CAP score. We also looked at um, uh, comorbid depression, um, functionality, so how functional a patient is uh, after this therapy. Um, let's see if there's anything I missed. I think that's about it. So this takes about 14 weeks total. So we consider this an acute treatment. It's not a chronic treatment. It's here, take a pill every day for the rest of your life. We hope you get better. All right, so in terms of baseline, bear, uh, um, baseline patient characteristics, mean age was about 40. Um, consistent with what we understand about PTSD, two-thirds female, 77% white. You can see the duration of PTSD in this first study was 11 years. The highest was 50 years, Vietnam veteran. Uh, baseline CAP scores, 44. So remember, 35 is your cut point for severe. So these patients had severe to extreme PTSD. Um, their SDS, that's a measure of, of how functional they are, was seven, that's pretty severe. Means these patients are having trouble holding down a job, uh, interacting with their peers, getting out of bed in the morning. 21% had the dissociative subtype of PTSD. This is an especially, I wanna say severe type of PTSD, but it's very difficult to treat. This is where a patient literally just doesn't feel like themselves, they feel like a shell of themselves. 18% um, were veterans, 91% had major depression disorder, 92% had a lifetime history of suicidal ideation, and 32% had lifetime suicidal um, behavior. All right, so very severe PTSD patients. So let's look at the data. All right, so this is that primary endpoint looking at their CAPS-5 score. So the top blue line is patients who received placebo with intensive therapy. All right, you can see that these patients had a 14 point drop in their CAPS-5 score. It's a really, really good drop in their CAPS-5 score just by getting um, very effective therapy in a controlled environment. However, the patients that got MDMA-assisted therapy did much, much better. A 24%, or excuse me, a 24 point drop in their CAPS-5 score. So just to put this in, 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 uh, in context, a drop of 11 points in your CAPS-5 score indicates clinically significant improvement. So these patients are doing much better. This is a very highly statistically significant and clinically relevant uh, decrease in their PTS score. And I mentioned effect size earlier. You can see here that's that D. The effect size is 0.91. Um, that's a measure of just how well we think this, this therapy works, and that indicates that we think this therapy works really, really well. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, moving on, this is looking at that SDS. This is that uh, 
excuse me, measure of functionality. Again, you can see in the top that's placebo-assisted therapy. These patients had an improvement in their, in their uh, functionality score. But again, the patients that got MDMA-assisted therapy had a much higher improvement or a much better improvement in their functionality score. And this measure, a four-point change is considered clinically relevant, so it didn't quite reach that, but it trended in that direction. It was still better than placebo-assisted therapy. And then lastly, looking at depression, again, about 91, 92% of these patients had comorbid major depression. So we're not giving these patients any medicine to specifically address their depression. But going through this, we can see very, very significant decreases in depression. And again, the therapy by itself works pretty well, but MDMA-assisted therapy works that much better in addressing the patient's comorbid depression put this all into context, what's this really mean, all right? 88% of patients who received MDMA-assisted therapy noted a clinically significant improvement in their symptoms. 88%. It's just a, a remarkable, remarkable uh, change in the patient's symptom burden. All right, so that's the efficacy, how well it works. Well, what about safety? We always have to manage safety or balance safety with, with uh, therapy's efficacy. Well, what you can see here is MDMA does essentially what we expect it to do. Uh, patients who received MDMA um, can report muscle tightness, decrease in appetite, some nausea that tends to be transient right when the medication starts to kick in. They can sweat, they can feel cold, so kind of those cold sweats, pupil dilation, restlessness, they can clench the jaw a little bit. Um, no cardiac, um, excuse me, non-cardiac chest pain was uh, reported in a, in a couple of patients. So these things are all higher than placebo, but importantly, these all, um, what we say, respond um, um, spontaneously. So essentially, by the end of the day, all these things have gone back to normal. There's no special intervention that's required. It's not like, okay, you started having this problem, so I had to administer some type of medication to address that. They all resolve uh, spontaneously. And in terms of looking at what we call serious adverse events, this is like, did someone have a heart attack or a stroke uh, in the trial? Was someone hospitalized? Not a single patient that got MDMA-assisted therapy had a serious adverse event. There were two participants in placebo that did have three serious adverse events. Uh, both patients' issues were related to suicidality. Uh, one patient ended up self-administering, or excuse me, self-admitting themselves to the hospital uh, because they were having some suicidal ideation. In terms of other adverse uh, events of special interest, so these are things that uh, in collaboration with the FDA, we decided we needed to take a close, hard look at. Um, because MDMA does activate uh, the sympathetic nervous system, means it can increase your heart rate, make your blood pressure a little bit higher. We wanted to look at some of these things specifically. No cardiac events, uh, no new arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, and as noted in the trial, no increase in abuse potential. All right. All right, so to bring us to a close here, I want to talk a little bit about who we are as a, as a company. So MAPS PBC is the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. So, you know, a lot of people say, what is a public benefit corporation? Before I started looking at, at coming to work for the company, I'd never heard of a public benefit corporation. Well, on the left in the dark blue, we have our traditional not-for-profit, like a 501c3 like DAV is. Um, these are uh, organizations that have tax-exempt uh, status. They operate for charity. They do not make a profit. They're not obligated necessarily to be uh, transparent because they don't have shareholders per se. On the right is your traditional for-profit company. Uh, these can be privately or publicly held. They pay taxes, they operate for profit, but they can spend their money however they want, and often this is just done as, as returns to shareholders and dividends or things like that. So in the middle is a public benefit corporation, so that's what MAP says. A public benefit corporation is allowed to operate for profit. We do pay taxes, but we spend our profit on a specific um, uh, a specific benefit and for us for public benefit what we're really interested in is mental health and being innovative in the way that mental health is is diagnosed talked about in terms of reducing stigma and ultimately treated uh, in these patients we're obligated to be transparent with our process or our progress and uh, we are allowed to have shareholders um, or stocks so in terms of where we are in terms of you know getting this potential treatment to uh, veterans. You can see here um, that we're on track. Right? We've done both of our phase three clinical trials. We anticipate applying 
uh, to the FDA for a new drug application later this year. And hopefully this will be on the market sometime next year, um, so coming to VA centers near you. So with that, I'll bring us to a close. Um, so we talked about a couple of things today. One is that PTSD remains a very large unmet need in veterans. It contributes to suicidality. It can be associated with a large burden to individuals, their caregivers, and society. MDMA-assisted therapy is a potential first-in-class treatment um, that we hope can really revolutionize the way that PTSD is treated. As I just indicated, we've completed both of our phase three studies, demonstrated significant clinically relevant improvement in PTSD measures as well as comorbid depression. We have potential to treat 1.6 million patients with PTSD by 2032. Uh, and this combination modality, again, it's not just taking a drug, it is drug in combination with therapy. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention this morning, and uh, John and I'd be happy to take any questions. There's a mic at the front of the room if anybody wants to come up.